Hello, and welcome to chapter 9. And in this chapter, we're going to talk about how stocks are valued. And this is certainly going to be a very interesting and important chapter, especially if stock trading or doing anything regarding stocks is something that you are interested in doing going forward. So we're going to look at what are some of the features of common stock or the stocks that we buy and sell and trade. That is what is generally known as common stock. What is intrinsic value and how is it related to a company's stock price? How do we determine the common stock values? What is the discounted dividend model? What is our corporate valuation model? Some other approaches. And finally, how do we actually deal with preferred stock? And we're going to look at preferred stock more in a later chapter to come when we talk about hybrid financing, which is what preferred stock is a type of. So common stock, if you buy stock in a company, what does it do? It actually means you own a piece of that company. So if you own common stock in Apple or Microsoft or Google, you own part of that company's stock or you own part of that company by owning its stock. And ownership implies control. If you own enough of the stock of a company, you actually have control over that company. Stockholders get to vote and they get to elect the directors. Remember the board of directors back to the beginning of the class is who controls a public company. And the stockholders elect them. And then the directors elect the management, the C-level offices such as CEO, CFO, all of that stuff. Remember, the goal of good management is to maximize the stock price and, as a consequence, maximize shareholder wealth. So, intrinsic value of a company is what is a company actually worth? That's its intrinsic value. So, how is that related to our stock price? How is that related to our stock price? So outside investors, corporate insiders, and analysts, so anybody interested in buying a company's stock, they use a variety of approaches. So anytime someone analyzes a stock, if you see a write-up, we analyze the stock to go up or down, they're using various approaches to determine what its price should be. If markets are truly in equilibrium, we would assume that a company's stock price is equal to its intrinsic value. The company is trading at that snapshot in time, at exactly what it is worth. So outsiders estimate intrinsic value to help determine which stocks are attractive to buy or sell, and stocks with a price below are undervalued. Those with a price above, overvalued. So obviously not all stocks are always trading perfectly at their intrinsic value. There are opportunities where you might want to buy or sell a stock if you deem it to be under or overvalued. Now this isn't an exact science. If you had the ability to beat the market every time, you would be the most successful investor. Obviously that's, no one can do this, but the better you can do this kind of analysis, the more likely you will be right and, and be able to make large profits as a consequence. So there are three main approaches if we want to estimate the intrinsic value of a company's stock. First is the discounted dividend model where we use time value of money, which we did in chapter five to discount a stock's dividends, then the corporate valuation model, and then models based on what are known as market multiples. So the discounted dividend model is exactly that. We find the value of a stock by finding the present value of all of its cash flows or dividends expected to be generated by it. So we're just basically finding the present value of all of the dividends you would expect to earn if you own the stock and use it to arrive at a price. So if a stock is a constant growth stock, this is a company whose dividends are expected to grow forever at some sort of a constant rate given as G. And G is a percent. It's the percent of how dividends are growing. So dividend one is gonna be dividend zero, the one we get today. So dividend a year from now would be the dividend we got today times one plus the growth rate to the first dividend 2 to the second, dividend T, or whatever we deem the year we want to see, to the T. So it is going to grow every year by that constant rate. So if G is constant, the discounted dividend formula is just simply going to be the following. Price 0, or price right now, is equal to next year's dividend 
divided by return on the stock minus the growth rate. So very easy to do this on a calculator or in Excel, but it would allow you to get a value for what the stock should be trading at right now based off of its dividends. So if we look here, future dividends and their present values, remember the present value of something is less and less the further out, and that's what we're looking at. Dividends are going up, that's the blue line, but the present value of them is going down, that's the gray line as time increases. Money you get long in the future is worth a lot less now than it is going to be when you get it. Think time value of money, so the further we go out, the present value of those dividends is decreasing, even though the dividends themselves are going up. What happens if growth is greater than return on the stock? So what happens if dividends are growing higher than your stock return? So if that's the case, the constant growth formula would give you a negative stock price. Obviously, that's not possible. The lowest the stock price could be is zero. So a negative stock price is not mathematically possible. The constant growth model can only be used if stock return is greater than growth and you would expect that growth to be constant forever. Not all companies meet that requirement. Not all companies have constant dividend growth. So what if we want to use the security market line to calculate the required rate of return? So if our risk-free rate is 3%, our market return is 8%, and beta is 1.2, how do we get it? Well, what we do is the following. We start off with our risk-free rate, and then we're going to add our risk premium. Remember, the risk premium is the market rate minus the risk-free rate multiplying beta. If beta is 1, it's exactly equal to the market risk premium. If it's lower than one, it's less risky than the market. If it's greater than one, more risky. This stock has a beta of 1.2, therefore it is riskier than the overall market. And your required rate of return here is going to be 9%. So if we want to find the dividends for the next three years and their present values, and we want to find our intrinsic value, so dividend zero was 2%, growth is a constant four. This is what we just looked at, the same formula. So $2 was dividend zero. Dividend one would be 208, that's just two times 1.04 to the one, and then to the two, 2.1632, to the three, 2.24973. And here's all of those dividends, their present values right now, just simply using either the PV function or a financial calculator. So how do we find the company's intrinsic value? Same formula we just looked at. So we know dividend one is 2.08. We got $2 this year, next year we'll get $2.08. And then we divide that by the difference between our stock return and our growth rate. And we would get an answer of 4160. So using this method, it would be determined that this stock should be trading at $41.60. That's using the discounted dividend model. So the discounted dividend model is going to be a good way to determine a stock price as long as it meets the caveats we just saw. So dividend one in a year from now. So what's the stock's expected value one year from now? Dividend one will be paid out already. Dividend one a year from now is dividend zero. So if we want to know price a year from now, it's going to be use dividend two and divide by return on your stock minus growth. So we would expect the price for year one to now be 43.26. Another way we can do it is just once again, Multiply price zero by your growth rate of 4%, you'll get the exact same answer. So either one would work. If the stock is growing by 4%, take year zero's price and multiply it by 4%. Either one would work. So what if we want to find our dividend yield, capital gains yield, and total return? Dividend yield is something given often in stock quotes and things like that, dividend yield is going to be dividend one divided by price zero, or in this case, 5%.
Dividend yield changes because stock prices change. So you, your dividend yield does vary. Uh, every time you pull up a quote, it does change a little bit because prices aren't static. But dividend yield is whatever the price is right now. P0 is on the bottom. And the next expected dividend, D1, is going to be on the top. And that gives us our dividend yield. Capital gains yield is the difference between price one and price zero over price zero. And it should be equal to our growth rate here, which it is 4%. And total return is going to be dividend yield plus your capital gains yield, in this case, 9%. That's our total return. What would the expected price be today if growth is equal to zero? So in this case, if the stock isn't growing in terms of the dividends, if they're just a constant dividend, you would treat it just like a perpetuity, which we looked at in previous chapters. In this case, you're going to just simply divide your payment by the return of 9%, and you would get 22.22. So if the dividends aren't growing, the stock just pays a flat $2 dividend every year. Your current stock price, you would treat it as a perpetuity, the present value of such and you would get $22.22. So what about super normal growth? What about super normal growth? What if growth is 30% for one year, 20% for one year, and then 10% for one year before just going to 4% long run? So this is a company that's going to grow tremendously for the first three years and then flatten out. You can't use the constant growth model, but growth does become constant after three years. So if you have non-constant growth, what you have to do is find the present value, find the present value of the first three dividends, so use the growth formula we looked at, year one, 2.6, year two, 3.12, and year three, 3.432, and then find the present value of all of those. And then starting in year four, we can now use the regular formula. So it's gonna be dividend one, which would be year four, because we wanna find from year three on, and then divide by the difference between our growth on our stock and our dividend growth rate, and you would get 71.39. That's the present value of all dividends from year four on in year three money. And then we find the present value to right now, and we get 55.123. 62.784 is just the present value of all of that stuff added up together. So for this stock with non-constant growth, we would say 62.784 is our current stock price. That's going to be our current stock price. So in this situation, what's our dividend yield for the first year? In the first year, it's 4.14%, and our capital gains yield 4.86%. During non-constant growth, dividend yield and capital gains yield are not constant, and capital gains yield does not equal growth, whereas if it is constant growth, they do. After time three, the stock has constant growth. Our dividend yield is 5%, capital gains yield four. So they then achieve what they did in the previous example with the constant growth after time three. So not all companies just grow at a perfectly constant rate. So if you have non-constant growth, you have to find the present value of those years before it goes constant. What if growth is zero for three years before a long run growth of 4%? Well, if growth is zero, you're just going to find the present value of all of those $2 payments for the first three years, and then use your formula once again for the remaining ones. In this case, stock price 3719. So in this case, the first three dividends never grew. They were just a flat $2, and then the company started growing. So this is the opposite situation. It's still non-constant growth, but instead of tremendous growth the first three years, you got no growth the first three years. And
and capital gains and dividend yield in the first year, dividend yield 5.38%, capital gains yield 3.62, so they're not the same, obviously, and capital gains yield does not equal growth. After time three, the stock has constant growth, dividend yield 5%, capital gains yield now that growth rate of four. So similar situation, only this is the opposite. Instead of the stock being worth a lot because you have a lot of high dividend payments at the beginning, this one you had no growth at the beginning, so they were flat. The stock is worth significantly less. If the stock was expected to have negative growth, uh, would anybody buy it and what's its value? Even though the dividends are getting smaller, it's still making cash flow. So even if you went from $2 to $1.90 or something like that, it's still positive. It's just declining. So it is going to have positive value. It's just going to be less. So in this case, if dividend, um, what is price zero here? If dividend zero was $2, but we now have a negative 4% growth rate, we're multiplying by 0.96. And then we're dividing by the 9% minus negative 0.04 or plus 0.04. And you get a much smaller price. So it is going to hurt the price if dividends are declining, but it does still have a positive value because the stock is still making cash flows. They're just getting smaller. So if a stock is expected to have negative growth, it's obviously going to hurt its share price, but it's not going to make it zero. And it doesn't mean that people aren't necessarily going to want to own the stock. You are still going to get positive cash flows. They're just shrinking. So that's what we mean by negative growth. Not that it's going to zero tomorrow, it means that the growth of the dividends is, however, declining. What would our yield be? Capital gains yield obviously is negative because we have a negative growth rate. The dividend yield, however, is larger. It's 13% because the stock price is small. So since the stock is experiencing constant growth, dividend yield and capital gains yield are constant dividend yield is sufficiently large to offset the negative capital gain. So even though we're losing money to the share price, the dividend yield is going up because the share price is going down. And as a consequence, even though the dividends are declining, the share price is going down and we're getting a larger dividend yield. So we're still achieving 9% growth even though um, the price of the stock is dropping. So just because the price of your stock may drop, you may still be making money if it's paying a sufficiently large dividend. Keep that in mind when you value dividend paying stocks. Remember, not all stocks do pay dividends, but when they do, if once again, the price is dropping of the shares, but the dividend is sufficiently large, you may still be earning a good rate of return. What's the corporate valuation model? This is called the free cash flow method, and this is a way we can value companies by suggesting the value of the company equals the present value of all of its cash flows, which is the market value of its operations, plus the market value of any non-operating assets that the company might own as well. So free cash flow is the firm's after-tax operating income minus the net capital investment. So free cash flow is earnings before interest and taxes times your tax rate, plus any depreciation and amortization costs, and then minus any capital expenditures plus change in networking capital. Now, what do you get? Finding the market value of your firm's operations by finding the present value of all future cash flows. Add the market value of any non-operating assets and subtract the market value of any debt and preferred stock to get the market value of common stock Divide the market value of common stock by the number of shares outstanding to get your intrinsic stock price. When you use this model, however, there are some issues. It is often preferred to the discounted dividend model for one very big reason. A lot of companies don't pay dividends. A lot of growth forward stocks, tech heavy companies, anything like that, a lot of them don't pay dividends. They take any money they make and plow it back into the company. So as a consequence, if the company doesn't pay dividends, we can't use its dividends to forecast its price. There aren't any. Or dividends may be hard to forecast. Some companies may pay erratic dividends. They may pay dividends very seldomly, only in very good economic times and then no, or very seldomly in general. They may just pay special dividends or something like that. So if their dividends are hard to forecast, you're not going to want to use that model either. 
Similar to the discounted dividend model, it assumes at some point a company's free cash flow will grow at a constant rate. And horizon value is the value of a firm's operations at the point growth becomes constant. So if we have a long run growth of 5% of a company's cash flows and a cost of capital of 7%, what do we get here? So the first three um, cash flows from this company we're gonna discount back because they're not constant. We lost money in year one, year two, 10, year three, 20. And this is, I believe in millions, we're discounting this back. So we find the first three. Now we say after year three, growth becomes constant. So we do very similar to before. We take the cash flow from year four, where it's becoming constant, and we're going to divide by the difference between our growth rate and our, excuse me, the difference between our cost of capital, 7%, or our required return, minus our growth rate. That's what we're doing here. And what we get is for all remaining cash flows of the company, present value 857.13, and the current value is 877 and a half, 877,500. So once again, just like the discounted dividend model, when you're using the corporate valuation model, you set a time where you deem growth to become constant, and that is going to be known as our horizon value. That's gonna be known as our horizon value. In this case, our horizon value is 1,050 in year three, and we discount it to year zero money. Well, what's our intrinsic value per share? So we know 877.50 is our current market value of everything in terms of our cash flows. But this company has $40 million in debt and preferred stock, $5 million in non-operating assets, $10 million in common stock shares. So first off, if we want the market value of our equity, we add in the non-operating assets, we take out the debt and preferred stock. So we get $842.50 million. That's the current market value of all of our equity. To find value per share is pretty easy. You simply divide it by how many shares. So if we have $842.5 million and 10 million shares, each share currently should be worth $84.25. So we can find the value of a share by doing this. And this method is often preferred to the discounted dividend one for one big reason. Not all companies pay dividends. And of the ones that do, not all of them pay dividends that are constant enough or predictable enough to use the discounted dividend model. What's the firm multiples method? We can use various multiples to value a company as well. Price to earnings, which is just share price divided by earnings per share. Price to cash flow, share price divided by cash flow per share. Price to sales. So these are all various multiples that we can also use to value a company. So based on comparable firms, estimate the price to earnings. Multiply this by expected earnings to back out an estimate of the stock price. And we can also find for the whole company expected value over earnings before interest, taxes, debt, and amortization, uh, depreciation and amortization, excuse me. That's what EBT, E-B-I-T-D-A means, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. So that's an enterprise-based multiple as well. So these are all ways we can also value a company. Preferred stock, and once again, we're gonna look at preferred stock quite a bit uh, more in one of the last chapters of this course when we look at hybrid financing. But preferred stock is known as a hybrid security because it has both characteristics of equity and debt. Like bonds, preferred stockholders get a fixed dividend like a coupon payment of a bond. And preferred stock dividends must be paid before common stock dividends. So if preferred stockholders are owed dividends, the company must make sure to pay them out before they can pay any common dividends. However, if a company has a bad quarter or they have some sort of issue where they may not be able to pay a preferred stock dividend that payment period, they can miss one and it does not push the firm into bankruptcy. Preferred stock, one of the characteristics of it is if a company does not pay a payment 
It is not a default. The company does not go into Chapter 11 or bankruptcy protection or anything like that. And it's not a great sign. And when we cover preferred stock more, we'll go into these reasons. However, it won't actually push the company into bankruptcy. Finally, our last slide, if preferred stock with an annual dividend of five bucks sells for $100, what is our return? Treat this as a perpetuity as well. So value is equal to the dividend payment over the return, and you can back out the return pretty easily using the perpetuity formula. You would get, in this case, 5%. So we will look at preferred stock quite a bit more, but that is the intro to it here and how we can find the expected return of that preferred stock. So that's going to take us to the end of chapter seven on valuing stock prices. And we will continue on with more of these concepts in the chapters to come.